thank you so much. I am uh, probably not going to talk as much as everybody else about theory because I find myself strangely in agreement with everything they said. This is so unusual for me <laughs> to be anywhere near the same frame of mind. I, I'm, I'm, I, I know that I like, don't think the way other people think because I watch this game show called Family Feud. <laughs> have you ever seen the show? You have to match the most popular answer to a survey. I never get the answer right, ever. It's always things like, name an occupation that's almost always filled by men. I say, pimp. <laughs> it's never up there. It never makes the survey. <laughs> So it's an extraordinary treat to be here with people who are thinking like me. And also at this institute, I couldn't believe it. I never do due diligence. That's a really bad thing about me. But I actually went to the website of the Palo Alto. Well, I read the email from someone who went to the website. <laughs> and he said that it was all about unusual ideas, humor, art, science, movies, and I'm like, I can't believe this because I am doing a funny movie about an unusual idea. <laughs> and here's the idea, that we're in the middle of a paradigm shift. We're moving from the universe that Newton, Sir Isaac Newton described, the very clockwork, rational, predictable universe, to the universe of quantum physics and chaos theory. I, I'm not actually going to explain the science because I don't know it. I mean, I understand everything about science except the actual science part, because that's math. You know, Not to perpetuate the idea that women are bad at math. In fact, honestly, I think the problem is women are too good at it. Really, when you're a little girl, you have an innate understanding of those abstract concepts. And then they give you Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to read and it becomes immediately apparent that there are only two kinds of men in the world, dwarves and Prince Charmings, and the odds are seven to one against your finding the prince. <laughs> That's why little girls don't do math. It's too depressing. <laughs> but here's how I got interested in science when I realized that the universe was just like my life. That the same laws that govern the motion of the stars govern us here on Earth. I didn't know that Sir Isaac Newton had come up with this. I figured it out for myself from reading an article in the, in the Los Angeles Times about dark matter. Do you know what dark matter is? This is the, for years and years, scientists thought the universe was just one big empty void with little clumps of matter artfully arranged as if God was Martha Stewart or something. But then they realized that the planets are hurling away from us at a speed that would cause them to fly apart unless there were some unseen matter exerting a gravitational pull. So then they realized there are two kinds of matter. There is ordinary matter like the sun and the moon and the stars which shine and which therefore we can see. And there's dark matter which doesn't shine and which we cannot see, but which scientists think accounts for up to 90% of the universe. And when I saw that figure, 90%, reading the Los Angeles Times in my house in the Hollywood Hills, I'm like, oh my god, that's the exact same percentage, 90% of the actors in the Screenwriters Guild who were never seen in anything. <laughs> At least not in anything that matters. <laughs> and then the article concluded with a conjecture that a certain type of galactic structure might actually be dark matter. And they describe these structures, and I quote, as gaseous celestial bodies that failed to reach stardom. So as far as I'm concerned, Broadway the Milky Way, it's the same thing. <laughs> and now I realize that how we think about the way the universe is structured and how the universe works is how we think we should work. And for hundreds of years, we've been thinking we should work like Sir Isaac Newton's universe, which is very bad for comedy. Because Newton used a certain kind of logic, 
a logic officially called dualism, but better known by its casual Friday name, either or. And basically what it says is there's only two of anything, and of those two, only one can be right. It's a, it's a, it's a, right? a logic of contradiction. One is right, one must be wrong. And we are so accustomed to contradiction and how we, that we don't, we forget that there are contradictions. We deny them. We, we, when we read them, we don't even register. Or when we write them, like the guy who wrote this personal ad in an Israeli newspaper. I am a sensitive Jewish man whom you can open your heart to, share your innermost thoughts and deepest secrets. Confide in me. I'll understand your insecurities. <laughs> no fatties, please. <laughs> but here's what happened. The Heisenberg principle of uncertainty came along. And even before that, well, I, 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 I get ahead of myself. Wave particle duality. It turns out the quantum universe operates by a completely different kind of logic, which is much better for comedy. Because that old logic not only said there were only two of anything, but it put one up above the other. Because if you only have two of everything, of course, one's good, one's bad, one's right, one's wrong. Tragedy, comedy, right? Form, function. And I never saw a better example of form over function than <laughs> a packet of condoms in a drugstore, seriously, that had the American flag embossed upon them. And I'm like, oh no. I mean, I would never consider having sex with a man who wore such a thing, because, I mean, it seems so risky. Doesn't it? What if he were wearing one and someone famous died? <laughs> He'd have to fly it at half mass. It's form over function. But now, <laughs> so now with wave duality, with wave particle duality, though, what happened was, you know, for years and years, physicists couldn't decide about the nature of light. In fact, they were in an either-or argument. Some said it's a wave, others said, no, it's a particle, no, it's a wave, no, it's a particle, no, until a man named Louis de Broglie came along like Faye Dunaway in the movie Chinatown and said it's a wave and a particle. And suddenly there was this new logic, a logic I call and, and. And of course, physicists said, well, you know, it doesn't really operate in the real world, but it does. They found out now that it does. And I'm so happy about that because that's the logic that we all intuitively know, isn't it? That people are good and bad, ideas are right and wrong. Freud was right about penis envy, there is such a thing, and he was wrong about who has it. <laughs> The great thing about and and is it's all about connection, which is, of course, what comedy is about. It's what technology is about. It's all about connection. So here, I mentioned the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty. So um, let me tell you why it's important first. Because another thing about Newton's universe, that rational universe, they called it the clockwork universe. Because it meant that everything in the universe obeyed certain universal fundamental laws. For everything, there was a reason. For every cause, there's an effect. The universe makes sense. And of course, we like everything to make sense. That's why we don't like senseless crime. We like our criminals to have a reason. <laughs> people who murder their spouses get lighter sentences than people who murder strangers. Yeah, because everybody figured, but they had a reason, you know, it's, uh, we, and the, the ridiculous thing, though, is that we honestly believe when we say everything makes sense, what we're really saying is we can make sense of it. We're brilliant, we're know-it-alls, we're masters of the universe. 
And that's why Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty is so important, because what Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty says is that you don't. You don't know everything. You can't know everything. And when I say don't know, I don't mean in the sense of like, you know, people who don't know on polls. You know, there's always this 2% don't know. Even when it's something you can't even imagine how they wouldn't know. Like this poll taken of married Jewish women. Is your spouse Jewish? 32% answered no, 66 answered yes, 2% didn't know. <laughs> That's why I always like to leave a light on. <laughs> but Heisenberg meant something very specific. What he meant was, you, the more you know about one thing, the less you know about the other. So the more you know about a particle's location, the less you know about its momentum. The more you know about a wave's momentum, the less you know about its uh, uh, location. The more we knew about Monica Lewinsky's blue dress, the less we knew about Osama bin Laden. So you see how it works <laughs> across the board. We don't know anything because we think we know, and we don't. So really, what Heisenberg's principle did was take us out of a clockwork universe and into a banana peel universe. At any moment, the rug could be pulled out from you, so what are you going to do but laugh? You know, so that's one thing I would say about um, that the one little thing I would not agree with is that humor is about control. I think it's about letting go. Letting go of control. Like, I was always sent out of the room when I was a kid. You know, I was sent out of the room until I could control myself, which was so stupid because I had no problem controlling myself when I was in the room. It was out, you know, this whole idea that, or, or trying to be funny. That's the worst thing you can do if you want to be funny. Try to be funny. Just let it go. There is no such thing as control. You can't control the, you can't control anything. We're all like the woman in that joke. I don't know if you've heard this joke about the elderly woman who's driving and her middle-aged daughter is next to her in the passenger seat and the mother goes right through a red light. And the daughter doesn't want to say anything because she doesn't want it to be like, ooh, you're too old to drive. But then the mother goes through another red light. And the daughter finally, as tactfully as possible, says, mom, are you aware that you just went through two red lights? And the mother says, oh, am I driving? <laughs> That's... <laughs> That's basically where we all are. And the sooner you let go of thinking you can control everything, the funnier you're going to be. Oh, and here's another thing about the Heisenberg principle. You know, Newton's universe has this idea that there's an objective reality. That's where observational comments, you know. But Newton said that if you use objective measurements, then the scientist can rise above his biases and his own prejudices and construct an experiment that in no way impacts upon the outcome. Now, I don't want to join all those people who are like, oh, science is, doesn't give you reality. You know, I'm not a climate change denier or anything like that. I, 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 and I hate this, you know, people thinking they can just make up anything and call it reality, or, or, and, and they suffer for it. Like, you know, what I call correspondence reality, it's kind of like reality, but it isn't really. And I call it that after a lion tamer I read about in the National Enquirer. <laughs> who was severely mauled by his lion. And, uh, and the, um, the National Enquirer, I'm trying to find the quote here, oh yeah. So the National Enquirer went on to say that Russell, the name of the lion tamer, it said, Russell, who learned lion taming through a correspondence course. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't mean that, but, Honestly, I don't know really if anyone can rise above his own prejudices. 
I couldn't. I always thought I was like, you know, no prejudices. And then I was sent to Germany to write a comedy show. And like out of nowhere came this intense paranoia that was so insane that, well, it just goes to show you how prejudice can run into good time because they were so nice to me, you know. Every day they said, oh, Olga, look, she's cute as a button. <laughs> but I thought they were saying I would be cute as a button. <laughs> But here's the other thing. Here's the other thing about that objective thing that says the uh, experimenter doesn't impact on the outcome. I think this is where we get the idea of action heroes. You know, our, our, our favorite films are action hero films where the action hero takes responsibility for himself. He doesn't wait for the nanny state or uh, anything multi, you know, he, no, he takes responsibility for himself. But what he doesn't do is take responsibility for the impact his actions have on anybody else. You never see the action hero come back after a car chase and help the fruit seller put all the fruit back in a nice little <laughs> period. No. You never see Arnold Schwarzenegger come back and say, I'll be back with my insurance information. <laughs> yeah. So actually what the Heisenberg principle tells us is that we're all interaction heroes. That's what we need, interaction heroes, which of course is what improv is about and what this whole evening has been about. In a way, I don't think there's been a single speaker who hasn't talked about comedy as being interactive. And, um, I am stopping here because uh, I'm, I don't mean, by the way, interactivity when I say interactivity. I think everybody gets what it means here. I don't have, you know, because it's been so cheapened by, tele, you know, the marketing industry. Oh, it's interactive, you know, and it's not. It makes me wish telemarketing were back. You know, well, I mean, you could at least talk to somebody, you know. And I, and I read once that it was rude to hang up on them, you know. So once, you know, after that, I let them get halfway through their spiel, and then I'd say, you sound sexy. <laughs> <laughs> They'd hang up on me. <laughs> but interactive really means what the Heisenberg principle really means is the, the experimenter does impact on the experiment. Because you know how before I said, you know, you, the, the, the uh, oh, I didn't say it, <laughs> but the, the particle in the quantum particle, the photon, manifests as a wave and a particle. That's because if you look at it through an instrument that measures waves, you see a wave. If you look at it through an instrument that measures particles, you see a particle. So what you see depends on the instrument you choose to measure. So really, as one physicist put it, reality or observation, the act of observation is an interaction. And I learned this actually from a psychiatrist that I um, went to. I, ha I had a brain tumor, I didn't know I had it, and I was just kind of, everything was going away, going away. And so I asked a friend for a recommendation, this guy I know who's like a connoisseur of psychiatrists. Uh, he's been to everyone, you know. And he said, oh, there's one in San Francisco. He's the most brilliant one I've ever been to. And he told me a story that confirmed the man's brilliance because when Bob was going to him, he uh, ran into another comedy writer who was also going to the same psychiatrist. So they could not resist. They got together and they concocted the most insane dream you could ever imagine. Every symbol known to Freud and Jung was in this dream. You know, tunnels, hot dogs, donuts, I mean, cigar, everything. And on Monday, Bob goes into the psychiatrist and he tells him the dream. On Thursday, the other guy goes in and he tells the psychiatrist the exact same dream, detail for detail. And when he's finished, the psychiatrist looks at him and he's like, wow, this is so weird. You're the third person this <laughs> week. <laughs> 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 
so I knew that um, this was the psychiatrist that I wanted to see. And uh, I went to him and I said, I just want me back. I want the me I was before all this started happening to me. And he said, there is no such you. You come into being through the interactions you have with your environment and the people around you. You are the sum of all your interactions. Hmm. I thought. So I said this. I was um, now working this material into my show about having had the tumor, and it sort of, in my opinion, got away from the show and then the movie that we're making of it because the theater wanted a theater director and the theater director wanted this personal story and I didn't want to do it. I could not bear to do it. I talk about interactivity. I talk about a lot of things. Uh, but when it came to it, the idea of opening myself that much, because I think it was Cal who talked about how you have to open your mind and ah. Uh, and I realized it's because if I tell my story to you or to anyone, you impact on it. When I was a writer and a comedian, I wanted to control my story. But I believe, as June said in his introductory remarks, or excuse me, it was uh, not, well, whoever it was, doesn't matter, said that this is about, the Institute believes that we can change our lives through the power of ideas. I do believe that, but not unless you're willing to change yourself. And uh, so I did it. Of course, the audience loved it. I have to be honest, it's extremely difficult for me. And then it seemed so ridiculous that that would be the thing I was afraid of. So I'm not afraid of death. I'm not one of those people, oh, I'm going to die someday. Oh, I better leave a legacy. Oh, I want my name to live on after me. And I'm not. Thank you, no. Because it's been my observation that no matter how brilliant or talented or nice you are, 50 years after you die, they turn on you. <laughs> and my proof of this is a headline in the Los Angeles Times, Anne Frank not so nice after all. <laughs> But if I wasn't afraid of death, I guess what I was afraid of is life, because life is change. And if you can allow yourself to open up to change and open up to everybody else and really let go of any idea you have in your mind that is different from the actual reality you're experiencing with other people, you can be funny. And I am a very optimistic person, probably the most optimistic person you'll ever meet, with the exception of the woman who wrote this personal <laughs> ad in New York Magazine, looking for anyone age 35 to 55 who can concentrate. <laughs> but, <laughs> Next to her, I'm the most optimistic person. And what I'm optimistic about is next year we'll do this all again, but I'll be sitting there and you'll be up here and you'll be being funny. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>